Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today's guest is Janice Mathis, Executive Director of the National Council of Negro Women. Thank you for joining us, Janice. And a reminder to our webinar guests that you can qu ask questions throughout the Q&A and chat functions at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to cover those during the show. Janice. Thank you, Mark, for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Well, and, and your parents are in attendance over your shoulder, and that's just so appropriate. It's so wonderful that, that you're here as the leader of an organization of organizations that have worked on so many issues that are touching us today. And of course, we're reminded by the killing of George Floyd and Ahmaud Aubrey and so many others of, of the need for uh, action today. And you've been working on these issues for so long. Talk a little bit about the organization that you lead and the leaders that are part of, of your organization? Certainly. NCNW will celebrate its 85th anniversary this year. We were started in 1935 by a remarkable woman named Mary McLeod Bethune. Her name may not be familiar to most folk, but she was the builder of institutions. Not only did she found the National Council of Negro Women in 1935, there's a college in Florida named after her that she founded, Bethune-Cookman University that has been in existence since the 30s as well. One of the driving forces for starting the National Council was to give black women a vehicle that they could speak as one voice because there were lots of organizations, sororities and church organizations, but there was not one umbrella group that could speak on behalf of millions of black women. So now because of our unique structure, with these 38 affiliated national women's organizations, we have about 2 million members. We also have though, because you can't just be focused on leadership, we also have in 32 states, 300 sections of NCNW that work in local communities on some of these issues. The driving issue in 1935 was they were trying to get a federal anti-lynching bill and so, you know, you have to pause and say, the more things change, it seems the more they stay the same. And so we're proud of that legacy, but we like to say we're fortified by the past, but we're really focused on the future. So a big part of what we do is on 80 college campuses, and they're not all HBCUs, places as diverse as the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and the University of Michigan and Spelman College and a host of others, we have small groups of students, men and women, who are members themselves of the National Council. And they work on, we work on basically four program areas. STEAM education is one, civic engagement and being a good citizen is another, public policy uh, development and monitoring what's going on in the legislatures around the country and here in Washington, and of course, economic stability and entrepreneurship <clears throat> because you can't you can't organize much of anything if you don't have the financial wherewithal and so you see us working in all of those areas and we're making some progress but it's slow it's incremental just when you think you've solved one issue there's another or this issue presents itself in a different way and when i think about what we've been through these last several weeks it wasn't just George Floyd alone. It was the accumulation of COVID, economic displacement that came on the heels of that. So many people lost their jobs. I was just talking to one of our members who um, has a relationship with the Foot Locker Company. Well, they had 3,000 stores. Now they have 1,000 stores. 25,000 of their employees are drawing unemployment, at least temporarily. So you've got the economic pressure. You've got the stay at home. Now you're working from home, if you're fortunate, and your children at home, and you're schooling them too. And then you have Arbery in Georgia, where I lived for a long time. So it was the, and, and Breonna Taylor, it was the accumulation of all of that that exploded into what we see now as a global moment. We don't know yet whether it will be a movement I thought Parkland, when all those children were injured, was 
going to end up in a movement, but it sort of just, we lost, our attention span is short. And so we're on to the next story. It seems to me that what is going on right now is people are beginning to really think through the whole idea of what systematic means in systematic racism. What does that actually mean? And it took not only the accumulation of these injustices, of these killings, uh, of people who were in their own home uh, that was being invaded by law enforcement, or a man dying on the street strangled to death while everybody watched, or a jogger being confronted by uh, white folks with shotguns and shot and killed. If you, if, if you look at that and you start to say there is not only a pattern here, but that pattern extends into our economy, into our education, into the way people are treated in society, and then you start to look at yourself, folks like me, what is my responsibility to ensure that we have the America we want? Because that's not the America any of us really wants. Yeah, I thank you for that, because that kind of progressive attitude is what's going to get us through and past this. One element I left out was when the, you know, when you work in this area, you assume everybody knows what you know. And so when the health disparities started to be reported, that African Americans were twice as likely to die as other Americans. And you say, well, that's not a surprise because we're uninsured and we're frontline workers and we, you know, don't have the health care coverage and we don't have access to, you say, of course there would be disparities. But then I talked to friends and colleagues and they said, I had no idea. I had no idea. Even now when we talk about opening up the economy, well, I've been at home since March the 13th. I'm one of the fortunate one in five African-Americans who can do a job from home. 80% of African-Americans don't have that luxury. If they're working, they must leave their homes. And I can look out my window and the garbage man comes every Thursday morning at 8.30. And the pizza man comes whenever I call him and the mailman comes every day. Those people never stopped working. The economy was never closed to them. And so the question we'll have to ask ourselves as we move forward, what do we do for health workers and essential workers who will have lost family members, who will have lost employment opportunities, who have spent through what little savings they had? How will we absorb all of that shock? Will, how broadly will we share it? So those are the kind of questions that kind of wake me up in the middle of the night. But I'm an optimist. You know, um, I've been Black all my life. And I know it comes with certain kinds of disadvantages, but I also know that it comes with a abiding faith that through good works and faith and love, we can overcome some of these, but it's an eternal effort. It never, when I was a young woman, I worked on voting rights and I thought, oh, this will be resolved by the time I graduate from law school. So I won't be practicing civil rights law. I can go make money in corporate America. And gradually over the decades, it has dawned on me that really what I'm working for now is my seven-year-old grandson down in Georgia to make sure that he gets to live in a fairer, more perfect union. Part of the, the issue that we have today is that, is that we tend to look at systems as if they are intentionally evil, that, they are, that, that there's some intention behind it but there doesn't need to be an intention for the uh, effects of how we conduct ourselves to be very negative. Um, if, we f if we forget that we're here as Americans to strengthen civil society as we strengthen ourselves, then we become much more selfish. If we forget that if we just have workers that are sufficient to fulfill our, um, our needs of today, then as the economy changes and we throw those people out of work and we don't help to equip them through our education system to retool on a periodic basis, then we end up with massive unemployment that, is, that affects certain uh, communities disproportionately. We have to really start thinking as Americans, I believe, 
differently about how we function in society and try to anticipate some of what we need to be a vital country going into the future. If we're going to be strong on a sustained basis, then all of our people, all of our members have to remain strong. And that's where justice comes in. It's really in our self-interest as a country to make sure that the least of us has the opportunity to thrive. Yeah, because if you, one of the things the pandemic is teaching us right now, that if I am insured and not healthy, it doesn't take much for that to spread to your household, even if you're doing everything absolutely correctly. Because we're in this shared web, whether we want to be there or not, that it's in our best interest to do everything we can. I mean, you talk about systems. The way we fund public schools in this country is based on the economics of your neighborhood. So if you're from a lower income neighborhood, the property values are lower, the property taxes are lower, the resources that are available to public schools. And then we throw up our hands and say, oh, those poor public schools, they're no good. I'm taking my kid out and we're gonna do something better. We built it to be unequal. And maybe at the time we built it, we were agrarian and people lived far apart and cities didn't trust uh, rural communities. But it's not just a race issue. You look at vast swaths of the country, what we sometimes call flyover country, lack of internet access, problems with clean water and clean air. And we live in these coastal enclaves where everybody has at least a college degree and, and, and most likely more than that. May not have a lot of money, but you've got wherewithal, you've got tools, you've got resources, you've got networks but there is a shared responsibility and it's always a balancing act. How much should a, a family that is well off have to sacrifice in order to make sure that everybody has a decent standard of living? I'll tell you what concerns me right now more than, more even than race, because I think ultimately we will, we keep getting better and we get a little bit better and then we go back and then we, we move forward again and then we tend to swing. But the, our economy right now is being driven by the Silicon Valley type innovation. And it measures success almost in how many jobs it destroys. Every time I go into an establishment and you're checking your own groceries, well, that's possible because of technology, but there are four or five checkers who don't have jobs anymore. Or you go to a parking lot and there's no more attendant there's an empty booth and you stick the credit card in and it makes the transaction. What are we going to require of ourselves that when those jobs are destroyed, what is our responsibility to either take care of or retrain or be like some countries where all the rich people live at the top of the hill and all the poor people live at the bottom and the rich people have armed guards surrounding them because that's the only way they can live in security. That's not the country we want. Well, we, we have this, this dichotomy, which I think is really interesting, where um, the investment in human capital and every state, every region, every city, every small town's most valuable asset are its people. And yet when we invest in people who require investment, that is pejoratively referred to as income dis redistribution. Mm -hmm. That somehow such investment in the United States and in our communities is somehow taking from me who have and giving it, giving it to somebody who, who has not. And, As and, if it were a zero sum game. But what we really want is a bigger pie, not smaller size slices of the same size pie. We want to empower that intellect, that drive, that determination. I tell you what, the people who come to serve my neighborhood, the garbage men and the they're working harder than I do. You know, it takes, a, it takes a lot of character to get up rain, snow, sleet, or shine and go to that job that you might have to catch a bus to get to. And young women working two jobs to make ends meet, but then they have not enough time to care for their kids. And daycare is always, I mean, I could go through the whole litany, but we have to ask ourselves some very hard questions. What am I willing to share so that we have a healthier, more prosperous society overall for everyone. Well, I think part of it is, is also a matter of thinking it through. You talked about the pizza delivery person who you can call 
and, and they'll bring in a, a pizza. But what happens if the pizza preparer is sick and somehow is, is transmitting the disease through that delivered pizza or, or the delivery person is sick? So it, 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 this, this situation with uh, COVID-19 is really showing us how bound together we are mm -hmm. and how, as, as a society, if we want to have that treasured ability to interact um, on a daily basis, we really do have to think about what happens to the homeless encampments where COVID-19 is racing through and there's no prospect of, of sustained medical care and how do we actually deal with that? We've, we've had these issues in our country in the past. And when we have dealt with them, the country has been stronger. And you see that over and over again in, in our history. That there are times when we become very selfish, very self-centered. The country doesn't thrive, but individuals do. We have to adjust that. So you have these, these four different streams. Could we unpack a little bit about how you you address these four different areas. You talked first about STEAM, uh, science, technology, education, uh, art, mathematics. Uh, talk about how uh, the organization is, is converting words. And I know you very often are a convening organization. You come in to discuss problems into action and how that action uh, starts uh, hitting people where their need is. The STEAM program is one that we're very proud of. Studies show that children who are exposed to science in the early grades in a fun, uh, interactive way uh, don't lose that love once they get older. And so what we've been challenged to do is, as young as kindergartners up through high school kids, put on workshops and demonstrations and webinars. My last call was with a woman. We started a Girls Who Code uh, partnership. And right now we've got about 30 clubs and they're meeting once or twice a week and they're collaborating with the schools and the schools are glad to have the reinforcement to help children learn the basics of how you can use technology to solve problems. At the end of the uh, exercise, it's sort of a hacker fun uh, where they choose a problem from their own neighborhood and say, this is what we want to design to address that problem. If we can scale that up, our goal right now, we're in 30 locations. We hope to be in 100 before the end of next year. That is something that is worth And then we do one day, we do one-offs where we bring in experts, scientists, doctors, so the kids can see. Right. There's an old, you know, you can't be what you haven't seen. And so maybe I don't know a physician or maybe I don't know a physical therapist, but now I've met one and I get to ask them questions and I sing songs with them and we do, happy things. So that's, that's one bucket of it. The other is the economic development, the sort of um, um, African-American women have been ferocious about starting their own companies, their own businesses. But the access to capital is limited. The access to ver um, venture capital almost is non-existent. But we do what we're doing right now. We do webinars where we bring in CEOs and CFOs and experts from various fields. You'll get your invitation soon. And they come talk about what it's like to start and grow and manage a business. How do you come up with your business idea? And we've got some great partners who help us with that. So a couple times a month, we're doing those sessions in the evening. And I had one young woman write to me and say, you know, um, because it ended with a pitch competition. They pitched for a little bit of money. She didn't win the pitch competition. I said, oh boy, she's calling me because she's upset. She said, I never could have paid for what I learned in those webinars. And it doesn't bother me that I didn't win because I learned so much that I've been able to apply to my business and now it's getting better. That's better than a million dollar grant. When I get one young woman to tell me it has changed the trajectory of her life, then I know that we're doing something that's worth doing. And it is in the grand tradition of America, this whole idea of transferring knowledge from those who have experience to those with less experience, empowering people, letting them fly, this idea of America as a meritocracy and allowing people with, equipped with knowledge to, to take off and, and fail. The freedom to fail, but also the freedom for, to, to learn from one's failures and continue with fortitude until um, a measure of success is achieved. That's, that's so, so wonderful that she called you to thank you for, for, 
for not succeeding in the contest. For not succeeding because she did succeed. She learned something about herself. She learned something that equips her and she recognizes this. And she, she, she came back to you and she's stronger for it. And, and that is a woman who will succeed, right? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not worried. So now we're thinking about how can we certify the course offerings because some of them are taught by college professors so that you will have something tangible. You can say, I finished the NCNW course on entrepreneurship. And those stalwarts, those who do like their eight webinars in the series each year, I'm arranging to have one-on-one -on -one consultations with them in the areas that they choose. So that in addition to having this sort of class experience, you get to go one-on-one -on -one with, a, with a CFO or with an accountant or some person who can help you along in your vision. So it's very exciting work. I had, um, I've only been in this job about four years and I had to uproot from Georgia to move to the big city of Washington and leave the grandchildren behind. And it was with mixed emotions, but I think I made the right choice. I'm doing work that I really love. Now, the other thing is, Henry, you ask about George Floyd. The Congress yesterday, the House of Representatives introduced legislation, the um, Justice and Policing Act. And we don't know whether it will pass or not and be signed into law, but it contains some good elements. So in our civic engagement sector, we're working to make sure our members understand what this legislation is about, what it would do, what it will not do, and ask them to contact their legislators. We don't lobby per se, we're 501c3, but we do provide information. And then you can take that information to form your own opinions about what causes you want to support. There's, there, there's so much, anxiety surrounding change in the best of times, and there certainly is anxiety surrounding change today, it just seems that there are some changes that we can all agree upon. We can agree that lynching ought to be illegal on a national basis. We can agree to that, that, that the, the, the initial impetus for the founding of your organization, that it still is under discussion today, and that there is legislation still pending and being held up by one senator is, is just unbelievable. We can agree on the need for reform. Uh, people in law enforcement can agree on that. We can agree that we have injustice, we need training, we need resources, we need more diversified investment beyond just enforcement in our uh, municipalities so that people do feel safe in, in, in a number of different ways. And it's not just a, a hammer to, for, that, that fulfills the, the need of every tool in the toolbox. We can agree on that. How do we get from this situation where people are urged to don red shirts and blue shirts and instead fix some of the problems that are so evidently present in our country? How do we get there? It is distressing to me that we seem to be in camps that never meet. Um, part of it is the way our political system is organized. You know, there's nothing in the Constitution about parties, but they developed almost as soon as the ink was dry on the document. And so when seniority dictates who gets to be in charge of a committee, uh, the only way you get to be speaker is if the members of your party vote for you to become the speaker. Right. then we've divided ourselves into camps structurally. You talk about structural systematic issues. You've guaranteed a system that will be divided between the red and the blue because that's how you get and keep power in the system. Um, I'm not saying that we're going to do away with political parties anytime soon, but they may be in the process of realigning. You know, they've realigned before. We think about African Americans and people consider, you know, they're all Democrats. Well, my father, in 1960, voted for Nixon because he was a rock rib Republican. He was still a Lincoln Republican. He hadn't been swayed by anything that happened in the 40s or the 50s. He was a Republican. But when the offer came, when there appeared to be more opportunity on the other side, then he switched sides like a lot of people did. Um, I like to say that Black voters are rational voters. They go where they think their interests are being met. And when the GOP makes a rational offer that says, look, 
we're going to take care of small businesses, which they believe in. We're going to um, reinforce Christian values with hard to find a, a black American who would disavow God. Uh, then you might start to see some, some major shifts. The other thing that happens is we react to tragedy. I'm old enough to remember the day Jack Kennedy got shot it realigned our politics momentarily. It was time for a civil rights bill because we had lost our young, handsome president to violence. This period that we're going through now is likely to result in some progress and realignment because we've been hit hard. This is harder what we're going through now than 911, more deaths. Who would think that we could lose to a pandemic twice the number of people who died in Vietnam? I can remember Kent State. I can remember boys in my college classes who were looking at the lottery trying to figure out in the waning days of Vietnam whether they were going or not. For young folk, many of them don't have not been through anything like this before. But I still have, maybe it is irrational faith in the country, but I do. And I think we'll survive it and we'll come through it better and stronger. A rational optimism is the only way to be in order to persevere through hard times and to make sure that the country evolves in the way it ought to. Uh, that irrationality is the thing that saves us and the thing that, that drives organizations like yours and, and women like yourself. And, Can and you put country. that in an email and I'll put it on my, <laughs> I'll put it up on my mirror so I can see it, type it just like that and email it to me. Well, you know, thank God for your parents. Thank God for you. Thank God for your members. And, and uh, let's, let's keep talking to people who are anxious and let's ensure that we engage people of different opinions. Because I think at the, at the end of the day, as, as your organization has demonstrated, uh, really listening and exchanging ideas allows us to discover that maybe our differences are less uh, sharp than we think that they are. And I think it's up to those of us who share that irrational optimism that sometimes we have to make the first step. So I thank you for the opportunity today. Um, I've enjoyed sharing with you. Janice Mathis, thank you so much for sharing the work of the National Council of Negro Women, your historic work, your ongoing work. Thank you all attendees for coming and joining us uh, at this. That's the nonprofit report to today, for today. And have a great day and let's continue to change America.